Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that uh, introduction. And I must say it is a great pleasure for me to be here today. And uh, I very much appreciate the opportunity to be at such uh, uh, an important meeting. Um, as you know, I'm an economist. And economists are not usually associated with art and culture. Uh, mostly economists are really very boring people. Um, in fact, you, you may know that one of the definitions of an economist is somebody who doesn't have sufficient personal charisma to become an accountant. Uh, and uh, uh, some of us who, I think, who work in the area of cultural economics have managed to shake off that, uh, that um, description. Uh, and as George mentioned in his very kind uh, uh, introduction, the work of people in economists in the economics of art and culture have tried to show how there isn't necessarily a conflict between the notion of culture uh, as something which is absolutely fundamental uh, and important to society and to individuals in society uh, and the fact that it also has economic uh, dimensions uh, which uh, can be quite important uh, in many ways. So the work of cultural eco economists has, has not been only about the financial um, uh, payoff, as it were, from, from the arts and from culture. In this brief time that I have this morning, I want to do uh, three things. Um, how do I turn this on? Green button, thank you. There we go. Um, I want to do three things. Very, firstly, to, to say something about what we have done in the economics of museums. It has emerged as an, as an area of the economics of art and culture, which is quite distinctive. Then I want to say something about the fact that some issues and some questions uh, remain the same despite the fact that one of the major influences on museums, as we all know, in the last uh, decade or so has been technological change uh, and the impacts of, of, of the digital economy. And then finally, if I have time, I'll say a word or two about uh, sustainability uh, if we have time. But I want to spend most of my time talking about the, the second of those uh, topics, uh, which is, uh, and, and, and to concentrate particularly on questions of value and valuation. But let me first of all, uh, and forgive me for being brief uh, in doing this, but first of all, let me say something about the economics of museums. We can define, I think, the ways in which economists have looked at museums in, in, into two broad areas. First of all, the operation of museums as business enterprises, and secondly, the broader role of museums in the, in the economy at large and in society at large. In the first case, um, the, the question that has been addressed by economists looking at museums has been to say, museums are, exist for cultural, scientific, artistic, natural history purposes, uh, but they are also businesses, and they have to run as efficient business operations. And if they, if they concentrate solely on their cultural objectives uh, and neglect the fact that there is a real economic world out there in which they have to survive, uh, then that can be a problem. So the question of balancing, as it were, the, uh, uh, or, or how to meet the cultural scientific objectives of a museum and still operate as a viable business has been uh, of primary concern. And this uh, comes down to issues such as pricing, to questions as to how the collection of the museum should be valued, and particularly in relation to commercialization and how far that process should go uh, in order to generate revenue uh, without necessarily compromising the cultural purposes of the institution. In the second area, museums in the macroeconomy, museums are, are an essential part of what have come to be known as the creative economy or the cultural industries. This is an area in which uh, there's been a great deal of policy interest in the last uh, 10 years or so, uh, as governments have realized that culture and creative industries have significant economic potential and that they can generate revenue, they can generate employment, uh, they can generate tourism, and so on. Uh, and these are things which uh, 
are uh, uh, useful from an economic point of view, and governments have therefore taken an interest in the creative industries purely from their economic and uh, uh, economic um, contribution. Nevertheless, again, the same issues arise as to the fact that, that museums don't exist a, a, as commercial operations, they exist as cultural institutions, uh, and so the ways in which the museum sector should be interpreted within the macro economy and within the cultural industries uh, has been of particular concern. Uh, there is also the question of the impacts on local economies, which uh, for museums in particular areas is of particular importance because often they have to demonstrate to local authorities that they are um, uh, a useful and viable uh, and productive part of the local economy and contributing to regional growth and so on. Uh, and this is another area where much uh, work has been done uh, in order to develop the means for measuring these sorts of effects. Uh, other areas include education, of course, uh, and the broader issue of museums in cultural policy making. And cultural policy itself has emerged as a significant area of government policy in the last uh, uh, decade or so, and the role of museum sector in this is, of course, important. But if we move on to the transformations that have happened uh, to um, uh, the sector and to the institutions, in the last 10 or 15 years as a result uh, of the very well-known um, impacts of the digital economy, we see uh, uh, a lot of interest amongst economists on how this has played out in the, in the, in the case of organizations like museums, which have a very substantial traditional role to play and have to reinterpret that role and to reinterpret how that role is discharged in the context of a globalized economy uh, and uh, significant impacts of technological change. Quite often, the, the, the role of technology is in, in the cultural arena is seen as some sort of threat, that it's going to displace traditional activities and is going to, uh, in, the, in the sort of broadest sense, uh, displace local cultures and local cultural activities and replace it all with, a, with some sort of globalized cultural um, uh, feeling on the part of the people and on, on the part of society. I think that um, it, there may be some truth, in fact there is some truth in the impacts, the negative impacts of globalization on things like cultural diversity and so on, but we should also look towards the, the very positive impacts that have been uh, achieved and things like the the, the opportunities for organizations to digitize collections and to contribute to the archiving process within museums. Uh, the whole process of operations of museum, I don't need to, to, to say this in the presence of, of so many people who work in museums uh, because it's been um, absolutely fundamental to the way in which museums operate. Um, and that includes uh, is, issues relating to visitation uh, and also the, the broader issues of what we do about online access to the uh, collections of museums and so on. I've done some work on this uh, in the UK uh, with the colleague on uh, the Tate Gallery and the impact of uh, an online exhibition which was run in parallel to um, uh, a uh, 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 an exhibition which was actually in Tate Liverpool to look at the ways in which access to the online exhibition might have affected uh, attendances at the, uh, at the real exhibition and so on. I'll say a word or two about this later on. Uh, the other area that has been of interest to economists in the uh, new economics of museums has been questions of uh, the competitive environment in which uh, uh, museums work. And this has uh, focused, for example, on the rise of private museums. There are, there are a number of, as you would know, of course, a number of private museums have, grow, have grown up with uh, rich uh, collectors establishing their own museums, uh, for example. Uh, and these pose not exactly a threat, but they are complementary, as it were, to the public sector museums. And this has been an a matter of some interest. And then finally, of course, there's the virtual museum itself, which uh, hasn't yet I don't think being fully established as a, uh, as a phenomenon, but it is certainly moving in that direction. But, as I said at the beginning, um, there are some questions, despite this rapid changing environment, there are some questions which remain the same, and in relation particularly to things like the virtual museum, 
the inalienable significance of the real object is something which we, uh, which we have and which is clear and which can't, in a sense, be changed. No matter how much uh, and how uh, sophisticated the technology to represent uh, objects, paintings, um, and other cultural artifacts in museums to represent these in, uh, in digital t uh, form uh, that can be consumed, as it were, anywhere in the world, the fact remains that the actual tangible object, whether it's a painting or a cultural art artifact or whatever, uh, remains unchanging. And that curious thing about studies of demand for museums has been, well, I don't suppose it's all that curious, is that there is something about authenticity and the real thing which uh, continues to motivate consumers and continues to motivate people who want to consume culture. Uh, and this is true, for example, in relation to paintings, where it is possible to produce copies uh, and duplicates of work which is absolutely under, uh, unable to be distinguished from the original, uh, and yet uh, the fact that a painting such as by Van Gogh or by anybody else is the real one, which is the hand of the master somehow or other that has a, a, an authenticity uh, which uh, can't be changed. Um, and so, for the visitor, uh, this means that uh, the, the experience of being in, in the presence of the real object is something which can't be changed and gives a heart, as it were, to museums to continue to display uh, the real thing and to expect that people will want to see it and that virtual museums or that online access to museums won't replace the real experience. It may be complementary to the real experience, and this is something which we found in that work which we did uh, with the Tate uh, a few years ago, that in fact uh, access to the online exhibition did stimulate demand for the real thing. And for uh, institutions, the question about the real object does raise issues of, of accession and deaccession, which of course you're much more familiar with than I am. But I want to move to the, the main topic that I was uh, um, uh, that I want to talk about this morning, which is questions of value, because this also remains an unchanging question. People still ask, what is the value of a museum to, uh, of a single museum to the local economy or to society, to its local society, or to the national economy, or indeed the global economy? Uh, what is the value? How do we measure the value, uh, uh, both at the, at the institutional level and at the macroeconomic or the social level? What I would like to do is to, is to uh, talk about some of the basic concepts which we, uh, as economists, use to consider these sorts of questions. Um, and the concepts are the same, whether we're talking about the single institution or the museum sector as a whole. And the first of the concepts, which is very familiar to us all, is the question of public value. And this is something which uh, um, comes up all the time in discussions about public policy. Um, because uh, the definition of public value and the fact that museums create public value is something which is clear enough. It's the value that society as a whole derives from public expenditure. But the problem is that public expenditure is evaluated by governments and also by private corporations on the basis essentially of the economic dimensions of, of, of value uh, using techniques such as cost-benefit analysis, which um, really considers only those impacts that can be measured in financial terms. And so this is a crucial issue um, uh, in thinking about value because, as we all know, uh, the question uh, of value from a museum goes much further than simply talking about its economic value. And this has led to the, the idea of public value or, or the proposition that public value in the case of arts and culture has to be expanded from that which is conventionally taken into account in cost-benefit analysis and to include um, a, an assessment or an understanding of what the, the cultural value might be. And this has led to, to a, a, a a sim it, it is a simplification in a way, but nevertheless it, it, it stands um, the test, I think, and has stood the test in looking at the way in which value is both conceptualized and measured uh, when we're talking about arts and culture. 
uh, economic value being all of the values that we can measure in monetary terms, uh, whether it's dollars or euros or whatever the currency is, on the one hand, and cultural value, uh, where the monetary yardstick is not appropriate. One can think of, of many ways in which value accrues either to individuals or to society at large, for which measurement in monetary terms is, is really not appropriate. Think about cultural identity, for example, whether we're talking about cultural identity of individuals or more broadly, cultural identity is something which really doesn't, it doesn't make sense to talk about it as having a, a monetary value. It's something which is important to people. Might, you might think of it as a spiritual value if you like, um, but money, money is not the appropriate um, measuring stick. Uh, and so that uh, leads us to measurement issues, which I'll return to in a moment. This, the, the, sec the second concept, which I think is uh, critical in understanding museums as economic phenomena, is, is the concept of cultural capital. This is cultural capital not in the sense of Bourdieu, which is a sort of sociological phenomenon, but in a strictly economic sense, thinking about cultural capital as a capital asset. And so we could think of museums as a bundle of assets being the physical capital, which is the buildings, the equipments, and so on, the human capital, which is the staff and the skills, which is contained in the people who work for the museum, but also the cultural capital, which is, uh, in the case of a museum, essentially the collection. And so we could say that the cultural, cap the, the cultural capital um, a, a definition of cultural capital is an asset, in economic terms, an asset that embodies or yields cultural value. So we're back to this question of value as the distinguishing characteristic of this form of capital in addition to whatever economic value it generates. Now those words embodies or yields uh, in the case of a museum uh, could, be, could be said to, to to be separated by saying that the stock of capital which exists in the museum, namely the collection and perhaps also in the building, embodies uh, uh, a cultural value. It also embodies economic value because the, the, the building is worth something and the collection is, is worth something, but it embodies some cultural value and that stock of capital yields a flow of services which are utilized by people uh, and, and that is the flow of services which are provided to users. So this corresponds to a, a very uh, standard uh, distinction in economics. When we talk about capital assets, we talk about the stock of assets and we talk about the flow of services that the capital assets yield. So if you think about a car or a house, it has a stock value, but it also provides a flow of services, and a museum is, is exactly the same, and the cultural value uh, is, again, exactly the same. So um, let's go back to the question of economic value and be a little more precise about what the economic value of a museum comprises. And this is really quite important to make this distinction, uh, and one which is not often made, because um, the usual approach, or the sort of standard economic approach, is to say museums get used for certain purposes, they have a value, we can measure that in terms of the value to the consumers who, who consume the, the museum services, um, and that's it. But in fact, one of the most important characteristics of the, of the economic value of a museum is what we can call non-use value. And the work in cultural economics that has grown up around this concept parallels a lot of the work which went on earlier in environmental economics when the same sort of thing was going on, talking about how do we measure the value of environments uh, and this was, uh, or environmental assets, and the same sorts of concepts can apply in culture to the cultural assets. So if we talk about the non-use value of a museum and its collection, it may be valued by people just simply because it exists. Uh, we do value the fact that some of the great museums of the world are there just because they exist, even if we don't go there, and this may equally apply to very small museums in local communities. Uh, we may have a value, we may place a value on museums because we would like to keep open the option that we might go there sometime. We may never have been, say, to, uh, to, to Florence, we may never have visited the Uffizi, but we would like to know that it's there, so we will have the option of going there at some time. 
And then finally, there's the so-called bequest value, which is the value of leaving things to future generations, and that's something which motivates people very, very strongly. So that's the economic value, and uh, I would, w would really stress, I'll say something about measurement in a moment, um, but something that I would really stress is that the non-use value is the part which is often neglected because it's difficult to measure and it's hard to put your finger exactly on it. It's easy enough to measure use value because you can measure the revenue that's coming into the museum and you can look at its financial accounts and so on, and that's uh, relatively straightforward. But for the non-use value, it's much more difficult. And I'll return to questions of measurement uh, in a moment. Firstly, let me say something about the cultural value because remember that these are the two components of the value that we're talking about. If we think about cultural value, we can say in general terms, a museum has cultural value, but it doesn't mean a great deal to say it in such broad terms. The way in which we usually uh, can proceed in the case of a concept which is quite general is to think about deconstructing it. And in the case of cultural value, we can think of more specific components of what we actually mean. Uh, if you think about, say, items in, in a collection, uh, say, a uh, collection of, of uh, artifacts or a collection of paintings, uh, they may have aesthetic value uh, because they're beautiful. They may have spiritual value because they mean things to people. This might be particularly cr true of different sorts of art, indigenous art or religious art and so on. They may have social value. They may be very, very uh, uh, strong historical value. They may symbolize something about, about uh, our existence as human beings. They may be symbolic of particular stories, particular narratives, and so on. Uh, and again, this, this question that I mentioned before about authenticity, uh, they may uh, have value simply because they're the real thing. And so this is the way in which uh, we have tried to be clearer and more objective about the notion of uh, cultural value, rather than talking about it in vague and general terms, to try to be more specific because it's possible to identify much more clearly and much more closely uh, the particular components or particular dimensions, if you like, of cultural value um, uh, by deconstructing it, as it were, in this way. So if I can move to questions of measurement, uh, as I said before, uh, Economic value is relatively straightforward because it can be measured in monetary terms. Cultural value is multidimensional, as we've just seen, and there's no single unit of account. And so we have to uh, think about if we're going to uh, try to uh, provide some sorts of uh, objective evidence for value rather than talking in vague and sort of uh, general terms about Yes, of course, everybody knows that museums have value. If we try to be a bit more specific about how this value is generated and how it can be, can be measured, I don't want to give the impression that economists are always and only concerned with measurement, but we have to face the fact that eventually when it comes to justifying the existence of museums to, say, the society or to the local government or to the national government or whoever, we need to be able to, to put some hard empirical evidence uh, on what we're saying. So in the case, of, um, uh, the case of, of economic value, let me say something briefly about both economic and cultural value. In the case of economic value, as I mentioned before, the use value is measurable e uh, relatively easily uh, as observable financial flows. It's not only financial flows, but this is mainly the thing which is tangible, which we can see, which derives from the usefulness of the museum to people who actually use it, uh, and that is something which um, is relatively easily seen. The non-use value, which is this sense of uh, demand or, or uh, valuation within a group of people within the population of a town or a city or the or the uh, the, the, the whole country or indeed in the whole world the non-use value uh, can only be measured by actually asking people what they're willing to pay in order to uh, receive the sort of public good benefits that, that might come so that for example if we take the case of a local Let's take it at a relatively local level. A local museum 
may be valued by people, even though they don't necessarily go there, um, because of those, the, the, they like to think of it as being there uh, in case they want to go sometime, or because it's important that the town has a museum, and so on. And you can find out how much they would be prepared to pay uh, by going around and asking them. It sounds very easy, it sounds very straightforward, but in fact, there's quite a sophisticated methodology has grown up to, to measure these sorts of things. Uh, called contingent valuation, and we're, and we're quite good at doing this now in a way which does get um, some reasonable approximations in monetary terms of what this valuation is. We did some work years ago about exactly that in Australia for a, for a country town which had a local cultural centre which was going to be closed down. It was in a historic house. We did one of these surveys and we, sh we demonstrated that even though a lot of people didn't ever go there. They liked the thought that it should be in the, in the town and that they were prepared to pay for something out of their local, uh, local government taxes to support this uh, local cultural centre. And that's the sort of thing that you can do on, an, on a small scale local level. You can do it on a national level. You could even, if you like, do it on a global level, although that's a bit of a, a hard uh, uh, task because it involves surveys and involves asking people questions, but nevertheless, it's, uh, it's doable. So now, the reason why I stress this notion of non-use value is very clear and very serious, and that is that it has been shown for a number of cultural institutions and a number of, uh, for a number of cultural institutions, including museums and libraries and so on, that the non-use value may well be significantly larger in monetary terms than the use value. And that's an important proposition because if it can be shown that within the community, whatever the community is, whether it's local or, or national or whatever, within the community there is a demand which can be represented in monetary terms uh, and that that demand is greater than the actual financial flows that are coming into the museum. That is a very strong argument for continued uh, public support. And that may, might, might also apply to a privately owned museum. There's no reason why there shouldn't be some uh, subvention or some assistance to private museums if they're generating these sorts of benefits and if it can be shown that they're, that they're important, people are prepared to pay for them. So, uh, it's, it is an important thing to say that if we're going to talk about value, uh, we need to make this distinction between economic value and cultural value. And when we talk about economic value, we have to be very clear that it can be divided into the, into the immediate usefulness, but also to this broader sense of the public value, the, the broader community value that arises from a museum, and that that has uh, an economic uh, dimension to it as well, and that that economic dimension can be can actually be measured. Well, that's economic value. If we turn to cultural value, it's not uh, quite so easy, because, as I said, there isn't a, uh, a standard unit of account. At least with economic value, whether it's use or non-use, we do have dollars or euros or or whatever the currency is. But in the case of cultural value, we don't have any such thing. There's quite a lot of work going on at the moment to try to uh, refine ways of looking at cultural value. I think that it, it essentially comes down to three areas. One is looking at cultural indicators, that is things which are not uh, exactly direct measures of cultural value but are some sort of indication of, of cultural value. There's work going on in UNESCO, for example, on cultural indicators which are quite a long way moved, removed from the hard notion of cultural value in, a, in its objective sense, but nevertheless is a step towards trying to do something about that. One of the ways in which we do uh, very clearly establish cultural values, cultural significance, is through the work of experts. And sometimes this is uh, uh, derided because it's just simply professionals um, saying, you know, sort of feathering their own nest, if you like. But in fact, I'm a very uh, strong supporter of the notion that in decision making, the people who know what they're doing, uh, the, the experts, uh, need to be listened to, and uh, not always. Experts, of course, don't always agree, and there may be disagreements amongst experts. But this is a, this is an approach, of course, which uh, anybody involved in heritage, 
has known for quite some time. The, the approaches to defining cultural significance, which have been in use uh, in a number of contexts, not least being in the World Heritage uh, listing context, then the, the, the approaches towards trying to estimate cultural significance are essentially this process of trying to, to put a cultural value uh, on things. And so expert appraisal, uh, which still needs to be systematized and put into uh, some more sort of rigorous framework, but nevertheless that expert appraisal is uh, an important component of the questions of cultural value. But there is also, when we're talking about public expenditure on heritage, on museums and so on, uh, there is a sense in which public preferences have uh, a role to play and there is also work uh, going on to try to estimate or to measure uh, public preferences. This was when, when the when the economics of heritage first began uh, back in the 1990s, one of the early economists who worked on this was Alan Peacock, a um, British economist who died, uh, unfortunately, just a few years ago. Um, Peacock wrote a paper called uh, Does the Past Have a Future? Uh, and it was about um, the fact that all the decisions in relation to heritage preservation and conservation were made by experts and the public, whose money was being used for this purpose, didn't have a say. And he was arguing that, th that these should be taken into account. I don't think he was actually saying they should be decisive, but he was saying that at least they should be taken into account. But, but that created quite a storm in the heritage profession because they, it looked like these clumsy economists were coming in just saying everything has to be measured uh, in financial terms and so on. Uh, I think there's a sort of a rapprochement has, uh, has occurred since then. Um, but the fact remains that public preferences, if not decisive, certainly not decisive, but at least are very interesting to know uh, in relation to these sorts of decisions. So let me just summarize what I've been saying before I finish. Um, the most, I think the most important issues that I've been talking about are threefold. First of all, as I've mentioned, the significance of non-use values in assessing the total economic value of museums. And I, and I continue to say, I'm talking here about economic value. When we talk about non-use value, we're talking about the economic value. But the second thing is, of course, the importance of treating cultural and economic value on equal terms. And putting them on equal terms is a difficult task because of this problem of the incommensurability, if you don't mind that word, uh, of cultural value and economic value. They're measured in different terms. Uh, and to put them into the, onto the table in a decision and how they should weigh up against each other, how, if necessary, one should be traded off against the other, that's not always very clear uh, and requires some fairly sophisticated decision making. And then finally, measurement is challenging, but systematic methods for, for doing these measurements do exist. So to conclude, let me just turn very briefly to the last of my uh, points, and just for a minute or two, to say something about the questions of sustainable development. Um, sustainability, as you would know, has emerged in recent years as a, a paradigm for, for taking a broader, holistic view of development, uh, which integrates the four, what are supposed to be the four pillars of sustainable development, economic, social, environmental, and cultural. Too often, the cultural is left off and it's only three pillars, but there is a very strong argument why there should be the fourth one there. The, the, the essence of sustainability is the long run, the notion that we are doing things now which shouldn't compromise the capacity of future generations to do what they do, and this is very important, of course, in er areas like climate change and environmental protection. But in the, in the case of culture, we can talk just as much about cultural sustainability and culturally sustainable development, meaning that culture has, uh, it is important that we take decisions now which will sustain our culture and our cultural resources and provide the sort of access to culture for future generations that we would like to see maintained. And this has been relevant in the debate in the United Nations about the new sustainable development goals, as many of you would know. Uh, the attempt by UNESCO and uh, other NGOs to uh, to argue for a sustainable development goal uh, relating to culture, 
didn't uh, materialize, and indeed uh, there's really, one has to say, very little reference to culture in the new Sustainable Development Goals which were issued last year. But that may not matter so much given that there is an international framework, an international legal framework for uh, integrating culture into sustainable development and that's provided by the UNESCO Cultural Diversity Convention for which most of the people, the countries of most of the people sitting in this room would be signatories and that is in a way more relevant than a set of goals because goals are aspirational whereas a, whereas a convention, a treaty is actually has some sense of obligation and it does provide it should, I, in my view, it shouldn't be called a cultural diversity convention. It should be called a cultural policy convention because it provides a, a framework for thinking about culture in the development process. So that does give us some uh, hope, I, I think, for, for the future. And so I think there's time for some questions, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, can we thank the professor again for that very fantastic presentation, please? Uh, very quickly, I know there's another session coming, but very quickly we'll take about a few uh, questions for the next 10 minutes of discussion. Please be very precise and ask the question. No stories. If you have a question, ask it and we will take that. So one minute each person. I'll start from Amar. David, thank you so much for that lucid, lucid presentation. I know you're a darling of Milan, but it's wonderful to hear you in Milan again. Um, my question comes from last week's Asia-Europe cultural ministers meeting in Guangzhou, where there was that 1950s tension again, that creative economies, creative cities, that intangible heritage is actually a hindrance. Some people took that argument, some ministers. So when you're talking about valuing, your last slide, we're talking about SDGs, 2005 convention, and you remember that we always thought 2003 Intangible Heritage Convention, 2005 or sister conventions should be addressed together and you and I had many conversations about it. How do you think, as some of the Asian countries fear, that creative economies, creative industries, and the, you know, the economic value of museums is going to undermine intangible heritage, safeguarding of intangible heritage? Thank you. We will take two more questions. Yes, and then after that. The gentleman and then the lady, please. Okay, continue. Thank you. Um, my name is Fiona Hutchison, and I work for Museums Gallery Scotland, the development body for museums there. Um, I wondered if you had any good examples of a willingness to pay scenario that had been developed at a national level to measure or derive the non-use economic value of museums for their population. And any advice on that matter, please? Okay, the gentleman and the lady, and then we'll answer to those. You probably can't see behind the camera, but I've been standing. Good here. morning. My name is Jonathan Cooperman from Ecuador. I have a very practical question. What is your suggestion for us museums on what economic attitude, awareness, or actions shall we not leave aside in order not to fall in paternalistic initiatives and compromise society, local, and national governments on support for museums? Thank you. Okay, Goranka. Goranka Horian from the Ethnographic Museum in Zagreb, Croatia. Uh, my question is, you have mentioned how it is difficult to measure a non-cultural value, and you said that there is expert appraisal, but also public preferences. But sometimes public preferences actually depend on expert appraisal and uh, some distinguished opinion makers in the society. So 
how you think it is possible to uh, distinguish these two. Thank you. Okay, so we'll address this first and then we'll take a second. David. Okay. Okay. Um, is this working? Yes. Uh, thank you for the questions. Um, uh, very briefly, in relation to Amar Gala's question about intangible heritage and particularly raising the question of, in, of the Asian countries, uh, I think there is a, there is a question mark uh, and has always been since the origins of the Intangible Heritage Convention about how uh, a convention can properly protect intangible heritage. Um, uh, and I don't think that issue has yet been fully resolved. Uh, certainly some of the uh, items of intangible heritage which have been listed under the Intangible Heritage Convention, of course, are, are extremely important and should, should be so listed. But I think there's also quite a lot that escapes uh, this process. And I don't think that's a problem of, uh, uh, I mean, I don't think that's sort of deliberate. I think it's just simply a question of the difficulty of defining what are the criteria for incorporating intangible heritage in a convention. It's much, more, it's much easier in the case of the, the tangible World Heritage Convention because we have buildings or sites or archaeological sites which we can see and which we can uh, assess. And in the case of in, uh, intangible heritage, it's much more, more difficult. And I think, um, as uh, Emma has said, in the Asian context, this is, has been a particular issue and can probably continues to be. It's ironic in a sense because the origins of the Intangible Heritage Convention, as you would know, come from uh, Matsura, the uh, former Director General of, Un of UNESCO, who was particularly saw this as the sort of crowning achievement during his uh, term at UNESCO, uh, Japanese um, um, uh, heritage uh, expert, uh, and he was concerned particularly in the first instance about the fact that a lot of Japanese intangible heritage was being lost. Uh, and that a, and a convention was a way of protecting it. But I think this is a much wider question uh, elsewhere in the, uh, uh, in, in, in the Asian region. Um, on the question of, of non-use value um, and, and national uh, surveys, now I don't know of any, I'm afraid. I'd like to be able to say that there's a, a paper I can refer you to which, gives, which does this. Um, but um, uh, the, certainly not as far as museums are concerned, there, there are some quite substantial studies does, done, as I'm sure you would know, uh, of the non-use value of, of particular cultural institutions, including some major ones. Uh, the British Library is an example which is quite well known, I think. Um, who, they commissioned a very big study some years ago. And in fact, incidentally, that was one study which, which also showed how the non-use value was so significant in, in the economic value that that institution created. But as for any national studies, there's a research project there just waiting to be done. And if uh, anybody is uh, in charge of research funds, then uh, that would be a very good one to spend some money on. Um, uh, the question of the paternalistic nature of perhaps uh, the Ecuadorian question of um, uh, of policy. I'm not quite sure whether I, I understood your question uh, exactly, um, but I, I think that uh, uh, clearly paternalism, for what, whatever that really means, uh, in the end is something we, we would like to avoid. There is some sort of objective sense, I think, in which, uh, as I've been trying to say, in which museums contribute to value uh, at a public and social level. Uh, and so the more that we can measure this in as far as, as we can in an objective way, then I think that's the, that's the process. And to be always looking towards this notion of independence and objectivity rather than the pleading of special interests. Uh, and finally, the question of public preferences. Um, uh, it's always a difficult one because um, as you said, as, as you said um, uh, public preferences are in influenced by experts, and that's a good thing. I mean, in, uh, as I said, I think you know what we need in all of these situations is the best informed decision that we can make, um, and the public is not necessarily particularly well informed, uh, particularly about cultural matters. I sometimes refer to things like. Uh, uh, say, um, Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, the work which was first performed in 1913 and which the public uh, condemned and threw chairs and shouted and said this was terrible. Now one of the great, great um, ornaments of 20th century classical music. Uh, if we'd left that to public preferences, the, the, the Rite of Spring would have died away. Uh, so, it's, it's, so we have to be very careful. 
uh, often I think one of the things which we find when we look at public preferences is that people say, look, I'd rather leave it to the experts. I haven't got time to, make, to acquaint myself with this issue, so we'll, we'll leave it to the experts to make up their minds. And, and that's something that you can find. But you can use, there are methods for finding out what people believe about, about heritage, and my sense in relation to this is that's interesting information. It isn't necessarily decisive, but it is interesting information, and if we can find it, then that's good. Thank you. We'll take two more questions uh, because of time. I'd be happy to. And then we'll uh, move on. There's a microphone over here. I've been standing here for a while. I'm sorry. I'm behind the camera, so you can't see me. Okay. You, you go on. Sorry. And then there's someone in the middle here. Okay. My name's John Fraser. I'm with Curator of the Museum Journal. And I'm wondering where you place the scholarship that happens in museums in terms of value, since that's a usership that happens long after the fact. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The next one. So a hand somewhere there. Nothing? OK. Hello. Hi, this is Lucimara Letelier from Brazil. I work there at the British Council. I was just going to say that when you mention, um, Professor, um, the use value is very straightforward. In so many emerging economies, such as Brazil, the measurement of use value is still not very much straightforward. It's something we are looking at developing and very important to uh, organize that and train the organizations to be able to do it. So my question is, if there is any open source that you would recommend for the organizations to have access to measurement in developing and emerging economies to be able to still um, have the mechanisms to measure use value of museums. Thank you. Okay, last. Uh, Mac West from the US. Should you not be counting in the economic value the money that is spent in the community by visitors to the museum when they go to restaurants and hotels and purchase materials so that goes into the local economy? Thank you very much. Uh, I will use my position as the chair to also raise one or two questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, Professor, do you think that uh, we would be very wrong to add into the new sources of competition for museums uh, things like malls and big supermarkets where most our children spend a lot of time undercover, they can play around with all kinds of things and enjoy all that. The second one is on the issue of non-use and use values. Uh, economically, in the economic terms, it's quite okay. Uh, but on a cultural term, from my own background, if you say non-use, which means it's useless, um, do you think that we need to look at the language in which we address some of these issues? So that in economics it may be okay, but in cultural terms, non-use, which means you, you can't use it, so it's, it's useless, basically. <laughs> uh, lastly, which is a much more difficult question, which we may go back thinking about, is the whole concept of authenticity. And I know in World Heritage, IUCN does not use that because trees can be regrown and all that, but we in culture, we tend to insist on that. But what is authentic? How do you measure authenticity? Uh, and how do you measure that value of authenticity? Is it something that is helping our cause or is it dragging us back? And do, do we need to redefine and rethink about the whole thing? Uh, thank you very much. Okay, very quickly. Um, uh, firstly, the question of, of scholarship, yes indeed. Uh, you, you, you're quite right and I should have mentioned that. The museums are um, uh, a major source of scholarship and research about, uh, uh, about art and culture and um, the value of that. Uh, there's a long debate in economics about, and the more general level about the valuation of research, scientific research and other sorts of research and particularly when there's no immediate uh, pure research which has no immediate sort of commercial payoff as it were and and the, and the work of museums and, uh, and uh, galleries and so on in this respect should be, uh, is often of that same sort. Uh, and that is undoubtedly uh, an important component of the value. Uh, it, it, it again uh, could be probably divided into that part of the research which can be commercialized or merchandised in some way and that therefore would be able to have a, 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 a direct economic value. There may be a non-use value if the research gives rise to some sort of sense of public value uh, and there may be a cultural component of that as well. So it's really quite a complex issue but absolutely one that should be taken into account. 
Um, the question of access. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember quite the question. Um, uh, so I'll go on to the question about impact. Um, uh, the, uh, the question about restaurants, museums, taxis and so on. Yes, of course, we, in, in an impact, so-called impact study or economic impact study, that is what uh, is usually looked at because there's no question that um, a museum or a in cultural institution in a town or a local economy can contribute not just its own direct um, uh, contribution to the economy, but also uh, the spillover effects uh, to other uh, organizations. That tends to be, uh, in, in the national context, that may not be counted because it may just simply be uh, expenditure in one area that isn't being undertaken somewhere else, and so it's just a transfer. But, but generally speaking, in these impact studies, those sorts of uh, those sorts of so-called secondary benefits are usually included, and the, and in the case of particular institutions, they may be quite significant. Finally, in, in relation to uh, to the chairman's uh, one question, which was actually three questions, um, uh, the, <laughs> the question of, of malls, yes, uh, uh, kids do spend a lot of time in, in malls. They spend a lot of time looking at their computer screens. Um, and all I can say in relation to that, yes, yes, I guess that that probably is, in a sense, competition. Um, I mean, the competitive environment for cultural services is one which is changing. And one of the interesting questions, I think, which is a broader question than what you, what you actually asked, is to what extent does the online gaming and online uh, and social media in, um, behavior of young people um, displace their uh, attendance uh, at actual um, museums and cultural uh, institutions generally, or going to theater or going to opera or, or whatever. Uh, the whole pattern of cultural consumption is changing. It's changing as a result of new technology. There's a lot of interest and a lot of work being done on this. Uh, the influence of social media uh, is, is, is quite profound on the younger generation, perhaps on the older generation too. Uh, and this is the whole pattern of cultural consumption uh, is um, in a state of flux, I think one could say at the moment, and museums, of course, are caught up in that as well. Um, the, the idea of, of, of non-use value meaning useless, um, yeah, I guess there is a question of terminology here. Uh, it's a fairly standard term in economics uh, to say non-use value, which means the value that you get from something even though you don't use it in a direct sense. Um, the cultural value doesn't make that distinction. Cultural value, I mean, we could have a long discussion about how cultural value is received, whether it's something which is um, in, internal to people who, who observe um, paintings or who go to museums, or whether it's something which is intrinsic to the object. These are deep philosophical questions and, and things which we have to, uh, which, which we could spend a lot of time talking about. Um, finally, uh, on the question of authenticity, yes. Um, I, I think I'll have to pass on that one because uh, it's true that, that the question of what constitutes authenticity uh, may be a disputed question and may be, a, so may be not necessarily all that clear. It may be clear that the, a painting by Monet is the authentic painting, maybe even not. It might have, you know, its, it's provenance might be, be shown to be not, uh, um, uh, not valid or whatever. But I think that's a question I'll have to leave to the experts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, I want to thank you all for your patience, uh, for listening, and uh, particularly I want to thank Professor so much for this uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you.